That is good. What's up, guys? Derek, moreplaceforace.com. Today we are talking about a monumental day for Gorilla Mind. For me, for this channel, Gorilla Mind Energy is live on the site. I am stoked for you guys to try this. It's beyond something that just tastes great and can be comparable or edge out the big boys in taste. This is a completely unique entry to the market. What I deem to be the most efficacious energy drink. That's literally the first line on the product page. I think it's the case too. It is something that I have been toying around with for over a year now, getting it to suspend in a RTD format and getting something that hits way harder than regular caffeine, but in a good way, that's not just completely obliterating you from a stimulation standpoint. It is something that gives you a very, very unique mental clarity, amplified focus, unmatched energy, and it just feels more potent than anything else out there. This formula in particular has a heavy emphasis on the dopaminergic cholinergic pathways, as well as a splash of serotonergic activity, which I'm stoked to dissect with you guys later. If you make it to that far in the video, it's going to be a, a long one, but the formula per can, what you need to know, it is 1000 milligrams of N-acetyl-L-tyrosine, 400 milligrams of alpha GPC, 50%, 200 milligrams of caffeine, 200 milligrams of uridine monophosphate, 100 milligrams of L-theanine, 15 milligrams of saffron extract, 200 micrograms of perazine, and five essential vitamins in their biologically active formats, notably. And then the standard, you know, nearly calorie free. It is uh, naturally and artificially sweetened. It is no artificial colors. This thing is taste profile, edges out any main stream company, in my opinion. I highly prefer these completely you know i'm the most biased guy ever obviously because it's my product but i mean i've tried it all <laughs> and this is uh in my opinion at least 90 percent of the flavors we're coming out with are at least as good or better than the leading you know competitors and that's just on taste when you get to formula there's not really a comparison in my opinion like this is the most efficacious energy drink obviously some people value just you know convenience price taste and don't give a shit about any of the ingredients whatsoever you know for me having a potent nootropic formula inside of this energy drink was very very important and i'm just very thankful that it was not at the detriment of the flavor system the flavor systems are fucking amazing and the formula is really fucking amazing in my opinion too and you will feel it and i'm stoked for you guys to try it so now before i get to the nerd stuff this is in my opinion the ideal synergy between taste and efficacy and it is available now on the site we are only shipping domestically in the U.S. for now. Please bear with me. I appreciate your patience. I know I live in Canada. How the fuck do I have this just in the States, not in Canada? I apologize, fellow Canadians. We are working on it. Retail distribution is on our priority list, 100%. But right now, we are online only in the States. Logistically, it's a nightmare to ship these things over the border. Cost-wise, I feel bad for anybody shipping over the border to get a case of energy drinks paying you know, out the ass to FedEx or whatever. It is what it is, and I didn't want to uh, you know, overcomplicate it and you know, cost people an arm and a leg to get a 12-pack of energy drinks. So for now, we are domestic only in the States, but we are working hard and diligently on getting into retail distribution and also getting across uh, borders into Canada and into uh, global exposure opportunities and whatnot. So for now, it's available on the site. Check it out. I appreciate your guys' support and really hope you like it. And let's get into, uh, I should mention the flavors, by the way, before we get into the nerd stuff. Arctic White. This is the first flavor. This is grapefruit-based kind of hard to wrap your head around how to describe this one and dialing in the flavor was quite difficult but I would say personally I think it is kind of like a cleaner I wouldn't say it's like literally a white monster alternative necessarily but it's like in the same DNA if I was to compare it to something it's kind of like white freezy fresh fresca white monster arctic I don't know there's like a bunch of different uh I guess like white variants of this kind of a uh, flavor system that's grapefruit based, but this is Arctic white. Moving on to black cherry vanilla. This one is self-explanatory, tastes fucking incredible. Compare it to any black cherry vanilla out there. I think you'll love it. Orange rush. This is a very rich, deep, amazing tasting. Uh, orange flavor. There really isn't a lot more to describe, but it is uh, very, very potent. 
almost to the degree of uh, like teetering on the edge of overkill, but I made sure we stopped short and people who appreciate strong flavors are gonna really like it. I've tasted a lot of watered down orange energy drinks throughout the years. And this one it takes the cake in terms of its uh, potency in terms of not just the formula, obviously, but the flavor system in particular. It is a very satisfying orange for those who are into orange. And then finally, exotic kiwi. This one is very unique. If you're a kiwi person, even it has like a slight hint of vanilla in there. It's a bit hard to describe, but it is really amazing. And I'm stoked for you guys to try these. And we're going to be coming out with a new flavor every month right now. So stay tuned to the Gorilla Mind Energy page at Gorilla Mind Energy on Instagram. Email lists we have as well, the website, you know, our YouTube channel at Gorilla Mind. Keep in the loop for these drops. It's probably going to be on a once a month cadence. As of now, that's the plan. I have dialed in more flavors already and I'm stoked to roll them out, but we'll see what the uh, response is like to these ones to start and let's get into the nerd shit. To start the breakdown, we're gonna go into the essential vitamins in their biologically active formats. Before we do though, just mentioning in case you want to follow along, I actually wrote a extremely detailed article on this product, Gorilla Mind Respawn, a couple months ago. This is the deepest I've ever gone on a product review, I think in my life. Um, it is basically a complete dismantlement of all of the existing literature on every single ingredient in this formula. And it is what I am going to be using as the infrastructure for describing the ingredients in here. So if you want to follow along, there is a lot of overlapping ingredients. Like you'll actually notice the similarities between Respawn's one scoop dose and the Gorilla Mine Energy formula. You know, very, very similar for a reason. I feel this is an incredible cognitive enhancing product and is why getting it into a, you know, the heart of that formula into a RTD suspension format was something I felt extremely worthwhile and I'm stoked to say we did it and managed to make it taste great at the same time. So anyway, if you want to follow along, there is a very, very long article that I will be pulling this information right out from, literally reading off of it with all of the citations listed in here. I'm going to be chucking up a lot of abstracts, a lot of different studies, highlighting stuff where I can. Uh, throwing up graphs when warranted, but ultimately, if you want to dig in deeper yourself, this article is publicly available, published on my website, moreplacemoredates.com, and you can follow along. If it looks like I'm reading, it's because it's literally in my article, so you can check it out if you want to follow along too. So getting into the essential vitamins, why are they in here? What is the decision-making process behind including, you know, a couple B vitamins? One thing I've noticed over the years is the seeming trend of uh, kind of doing what is the industry norm. It seems to date there has been certain tried and true combinations. And when I say tried and true, I don't necessarily mean because they are the pinnacle of efficacy, but more so because some big company did it at scale. So other companies deemed it the way to go from a, you know, copycat mimicking their formula. This is what works. Therefore, this is what we're going to do kind of style. So, you know, the caffeine, the taurine, the very select inclusion of certain B vitamins in their cheapest non-biologically active formats. Like this is something you see time and time again. And ultimately the energy drink market is saturated with a bunch of different labels slapped on a can of what is basically caffeine, flavoring agents, taurine, and a couple B vitamins. And that is it. And that is like the furthest thing from what our formula is. And I'm very proud to say that. Like I said, this is comparable to this, but tastes fucking incredible and works better than anything else out there. And the essential vitamins, I always wondered why do they do this? Why did they choose certain formats of the ingredients? Some of it has rhyme and reason in certain scenarios when it comes to upregulating or um, facilitating some enzymatic processes for downstream dopaminergic cascades, but also a lot of it is just no rhyme and reason like some other company did it and it made sense for them so it must make sense for us so let's do it so i'll describe what we included and why and i have been somewhat critical in the past of arbitrary vitamin inclusions in certain formulas typically the reason being is that something like a vitamin c antioxidants in a peri-workout nutrition window for me you know attenuating potentially the hormetic stress of training for example not something i feel desirable or worthwhile or smart necessarily to do it's just like might do nothing but it's 
probably not worth the risk for whatever you get out of the vitamin C when you could otherwise use it in a different time of day. With this formula, it's a little bit different because I am not necessarily creating this to be used in a pre-workout scenario. It can be, certainly be, and it is very good at what it does, but it's not meant to be a pre-workout necessarily. This is for any situation, for energy, productivity, drive, etc., And including certain vitamins that otherwise might have not made it into a pre-workout, I didn't feel the exclusion was as necessary. Now, at the same time, though, certain B vitamins didn't make it into the formula and, you know, might have been one of the reasons why other companies didn't include it too, as I found out very quick that there is one B vitamin in particular that turns your formula literally piss yellow. So obviously, <laughs> even if something is worth including potentially just to ensure some, you know, insurance policy of having enough uh, B vitamins present for certain enzymatic processes. Ultimately, most people should be getting these from their diet as is and could supplement if warranted. But, you know, even if something could be worthwhile, if it's going to turn the drink piss yellow and be unattractive to drink from a like visual standpoint, drinking something that looks gross is not that favorable wasn't worth including. So there were certain things I discovered during this process. Worth noting my logic as I arrived to these. But some of these I deemed worthwhile enough to include, and I will explain why. So essential vitamins support various physiologic processes, including maintaining a healthy immune system, energy metabolism, and nervous system function. They cannot be synthesized in the body in adequate amounts and must therefore be obtained by the diet. In general, most diets are deficient in one or more essential vitamins and the synthesis of several hormones and neurotransmitters in the body are reliant on satisfactory amounts of essential vitamins present. And one example, B vitamins, critical for dopamine synthesis, which is the most notable actually of this formula. But Notably too, stressful and or cognitively demanding situations can deplete neurotransmitters or lead to higher essential vitamin demands to support these cascades. So adequate amounts of these essential vitamins should be obtained through a high quality diet model with whole foods, etc. However, to hedge against the chance of any deficiencies, I included a complex inclusion of C and biologically active B vitamins in order to be an insurance policy of sorts to maximize the bang for your buck out of the active ingredient deck. Because for me, including some of these ingredients, I want to ensure they are, you're getting the biggest hit from them and it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. And you have kind of the substrate and the fuel to actually, you know, push some of these, you know, the dopaminergic cascade, for example. So the first thing, vitamin C as ascorbic acid at a dose of 90 milligrams. So why is this in here? It plays a role in cognitive function through several mechanisms, including antioxidant properties, involvement in neurotransmitter synthesis, and its ability to support healthy, functioning, high quality neurological processes. Some studies have suggested vitamin C supplementation may improve cognitive performance, attention, and memory. In this formula, vitamin C administration is most useful in how it interacts with the enzymes tyrosine hydroxylase and dopamine beta hydroxylase. Vitamin C administration has shown to increase tyrosine hydroxylase gene expression. And why is this important? Tyrosine hydroxylase is the rate limiting enzyme in catecholamine biosynthesis. It is responsible for the catalysis of tyrosine to dihydroxyphenylalanine, also known as DOPA, which is the precursor to the neurotransmitter dopamine. Vitamin C is also a cofactor for dopamine beta hydroxylase, the enzyme that converts dopamine into norepinephrine and downstream to that, the adrenergic cascade to epinephrine itself. The general function of nor norepinephrine, just so you know too, is mobilize the body and brain for action by increasing alertness and vigilance. And I'm sure if you don't know, by the way, norepinephrine, epinephrine, it is just noradrenaline and adrenaline. Now, moving on to the first essential B vitamin and why it was included. We have niacin as niacinamide at a dose of 16 milligrams. So niacin, also known as B3, plays a key role in energy production, the maintenance of healthy skin, nervous system function, and DNA synthesis. Niacin supplementation has been associated with improved sensory register, which is the short-term storage of memory received through the environment, and short-term memory. Literature available suggests that this is facilitated through enhanced neuronal transmission. Moving on to the next essential B vitamin in its biologically active format, one of the most notable in the formula as far as the B vitamin complex, B6 
P5P. Maybe you haven't heard of P5P. Maybe you have. A lot of people know it by its abbreviation only. But the full name is pyridoxal 5-phosphate, not to be confused with pyridoxine hydrochloride, which is, we'll get into that in a sec. So much like other B vitamins, B6 plays overlapping roles in several physiologic processes to support optimal function. With that said, the main attribute of interest in this formula is the impact it has on the production of neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, noradrenaline. L-dopa, levodopa, is the precursor to dopamine, meaning that it is converted into dopamine in the brain. And this conversion process is facilitated by an enzyme called aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, L-dopa decarboxylase, which requires P5P, notably, the active form of B6 as a cofactor. So I chose to include activated B6, P5P, instead of the commonly used inactive pyridoxine hydrochloride because the conversion process here literally requires P5P directly. So not pyridoxine HCL. In addition, literature shows that supplementing with inactive B6, pyridoxine HCL, may competitively inhibit activated B6 from working and could even paradoxically lead to a B6 deficiency through supplementation. So a lot of other energy drinks on the market, you will see B6, but it is typically in this inactive format. Adequate B6 status is critical for downstream dopaminergic neurotransmission. I felt adding in the activated vitamin B6 P5P format was absolutely worthwhile in this formula. Moving on to the next essential B vitamin in the formula, we have in its active format vitamin B12 as methylcobalamin at a dose of five micrograms. Vitamin B12 is required for the development, myelination, and function of the central nervous system. Contextually in this formula, it acts as a cofactor in the synthesis of neurotransmitters such as serotonin and dopamine. And B12 deficiency notably can lead to decreased production of neurotransmitters, affect cognitive function in a negative way, causing symptoms like fatigue and lethargy. Notably, the two main formats utilized, cyanocobalamin and methylcobalamin are two forms of vitamin B12. Methylcobalamin is the biologically active form and cyanocobalamin is the most common form found in supplements and fortified foods. So personally, I included methylcobalamin in this formula because it is a better methyl donor compared to cyanocobalamin. And some studies have suggested that methylcobalamin supplementation may have a positive impact on neurotransmitter function. Moving on to the final B vitamin in the B vitamin complex, we have Pentathenic acid, vitamin B5, at a dose of five milligrams. Pentathenic acid, also known as vitamin B5, is involved in various metabolic processes, including the synthesis of neurotransmitters, and it is a component of coenzyme A. It can play a vital role in maintaining adequate levels of acetylcholine, which we'll get into cholinergic later, as well as attenuating neurodegeneration and myelin loss. All right, we are done with the essential vitamins and we can move on to some of the more exotic compounds. Notably, in our energy matrix is what we call it. Gorilla Mine Energy Matrix is our unique synergy of actives that create a very distinct cognitive enhancing effect that is totally unique and unlike anything out there in the energy drink space. This is something that will produce effects above and beyond the basic, you know, caffeine, taurine, nonsense that has uh you know permeated this niche or industry for i don't know decades at this point like this is what i believe to be the first actual nootropic stacked formula in a rtd suspension format so i am very stoked for you guys to try it and i'm stoked to break down some of this stuff because again i've been sitting on it for a while I've been toying around with it for a while and this is such a fucking hammer of a formula <laughs> like it's it's really something else. And for it to taste this great at the same time, it is, uh, it's hard to not get absurdly over the moon excited about. It's one thing when you have it in like a powder format and you know, you're appealing to the niche of the supplement industry, but when you can kind of like break into the mainstream with something like this, with this potency, with this synergy, with these unique effects, like it's, it's something else. And I think it's going to be uniquely appreciated and fucking stoked on it. So let's get into it. N-acetyl L-tyrosine at 1,000 milligrams. L-tyrosine is an amino acid used by the body to produce proteins and neurotransmitters such as dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. These neurotransmitters play important roles in regulating mood, energy levels, and stress response. This 
is a visual representation of the pathway for catecholamines and tracemine synthesis in the human brain. All catecholamines are synthesized from the amino acid L-tyrosine according to the following sequence, starting with, like obviously you could go upstream all the way to phenylalanine, but starting at L-tyrosine, which is where I felt worthwhile to start the cascade, we have L-tyrosine converting to L-dopa, levodopa, which then converts to dopamine, which then converts to norepinephrine, noradrenaline, and again, there's, you know, different tangents this stuff can go down, but ultimately, like, this is the catecholamine cascade that is, uh, you know, the most notable in this formula is this kind of, like, dopaminergic sequence and some of the uh, downstream potential uh, vigilance, focus-inducing, energy-producing properties are yielded via this cascade that I'm specifically highlighting. Supplementing with L-tyrosine has been shown to have potential benefits for cognitive function, particularly in stressful or fatigue-inducing environments by increasing the synthesis of these neurotransmitters. Now getting into some of the unique attributes of tyrosine and some of the studies conducted on it to actually parse out this data and find what it's capable of, including putting it head to head against some of the, the most potent drugs out there like dextroamphetamine. A lot of people don't realize it's been pit against stuff that is literally pharma grade ADHD medication essentially. So let's get into it. Effect on reaction time and vigilance. L-tyrosine usage acutely augments reaction time and vigilance and has been shown to attenuate performance impairments induced by high levels of environmental stress. Its effect on memory and military tracking performance was assessed as well, which is a very interesting study. Several studies have shown that L-tyrosine supports working memory even during periods of extreme stress. Another unique study, notable in this context, tyrosine was given to 21 cadets during a demanding military combat training course and the cadets supplied with tyrosine performed better on a memory and tracking test. Now moving on to the dextroamphetamine versus L-tyrosine sleep deprivation study. This is the most interesting to me personally having literal ADHD medications like dexedrine pit up against something natural like tyrosine that's upstream in like the literal dopaminergic cascade. L-tyrosine usage has been shown to overcome certain cognitive performance deficits due to prolonged sleep deprivation, including running memory, logical reasoning, mathematical processing, and visual vigilance. In this study, 76 healthy male volunteers who ranged in age 18 to 35 were sleep deprived for 30 hours and then given either placebo, dextroamphetamine. If you guys don't know, Adderall is comprised of two different forms of amphetamine. Essentially, we have dextro as well as levo. So dextroamphetamine, levoamphetamine in two different ratios. Dextro, if you know dexedrine, that is literally just straight dextroamphetamine. Um, so if you're wondering what this drug is in particular, those are kind of like the trade names that would be probably contextually most relevant for people to kind of extrapolate out how potent this compound really is that L-tyrosine is being pit against. This is a drug used regularly for ADHD or people without ADHD using it for like the pinnacle of, you know, smart drug performance enhancement, essentially. Phentermine, a very notable um, appetite suppressant that works through its you know, it's like basically a very, very intense stimulant that I don't necessarily feel is that great <laughs> for uh, what it does. It's uh, It obviously crushes appetite, but it does not produce the same dopaminergic, you know, activity as something like a dextroamphetamine. So it's uh, not as cognitive enhancing, in my opinion, from that aspect, but it is very potent nonetheless. And also l is being stacked up against that too. Caffeine, the beast of all, you know, compounds out there. Most people are already on caffeine and heavily reliant on it. Or L-tyrosine and metrics of cognitive performance were assessed. So expectedly, L-tyrosine did not perform as well as dextroamphetamine in some tasks. However, it still attenuated cognitive performance deficits in several metrics caused by sleep deprivation. And this was wild to me, outperformed dextroamphetamine in mathematical processing at the 1.5 hour post-administration mark and logical reasoning task assessment at the 5.5 hour post-administration mark. So logical reasoning is a mental activity that aims to arrive at a conclusion in a rigorous manner. In this study, the logical reasoning performance measures were response latency per response and number of errors per session. So for a natural compound with a superior safety profile, readily available, not a literal amphetamine, <laughs> it's a very promising outcome. 
uh, in my opinion. Moving on to its effect on cognitive flexibility in a double blind randomized placebo controlled design, 22 healthy adults performed a task in a task switching paradigm and they used 2000 milligrams of L-tyrosine and it was found to promote cognitive flexibility, the ability to switch between thinking about two different concepts or to think about multiple concepts simultaneously. Now moving on to the comparison of L-tyrosine versus N-acetyl L-tyrosine. L-tyrosine is the most bioavailable form of tyrosine or so I thought for a while. N-acetyl L-tyrosine is very inefficiently converted by the body to tyrosine after IV infusion. The graph above depicts arterial concentrations of N-acetyl L-tyrosine and tyrosine during intravenous infusion of N-acetyl L-tyrosine. As we can see here, micromole per liter concentrations of NULT going up to near 300 and tyrosine levels barely even budge in response to that. So in our first batch of Gorilla Mine in 2018, our nootropic formula, we had N-acetyl L-tyrosine in the formula based on marketing claims and hype I heard at the time, you know, similar to the, you know, different forms of creatine. This one's better because of, you know, fill in the blank reason. Similarly, I heard things about N-acetyl L-tyrosine that kind of sold me on it. And then over the years, you know, educate yourself further, start digging into more data and literature, blah, blah, blah. I swapped out the N-acetyl L-tyrosine for straight L-tyrosine because of this data, the IV infusion study showing N-acetyl L-tyrosine not converting well to L-tyrosine. Now, my stance a few years ago was N-acetyl L-tyrosine was a waste of money, uh, marketing ploy. It's like, a, you know, similar to a different creatine that supposedly is better, but it's just no better than like the, you know, basic creatine mono. However, over the past few years, I have heard a staggering amount of anecdotes of individuals getting clear benefits and effects comparable to tyrosine using N-acetyl L-tyrosine, and it was getting too much to ignore. So I revisited the data with a fresh set of eyes and found something that I'm, you know, I guess I don't blame myself for overlooking because I was, you know, younger, less educated, less, uh, I don't know, I just, you learn more as you go. When I first started, I was literally convinced off like, you know, some random blog articles that N-acetyl L-tyrosine was the best. And then after that, you know, I started to dig into literature, found this, uh, you know, inefficient conversion, changed my mind. And then years later, actually started to dig into the literature a bit harder and dissecting it with, you know, some level of rigor and scrutiny, in my opinion, and found a very, very glaring discrepancy that uh, I wish I knew about sooner because I kind of just ignored the fact that people were getting effects out of it. Every single study showing inefficient conversion is utilizing IV infusion. So it's like, it's, it's clear as day that that is what is happening. But my understanding of pharmacokinetics was far worse back then to really wrap my head around and connect the dots on what might be happening. So again, utilizing IV infusion of N-acetyl L-tyrosine is being used in this study and extrapolated out to assess how much it raises tyrosine levels. So we saw this infusion of NULT equals almost no movement of tyrosine equals NULT sucks. That was what we thought on the surface, you know, myself included at the time when I first read that study, assumed that like an IV infusion, you were literally mainlining it into your system, getting 100% bioavailability, bioavailability. So if you weren't getting efficient conversion of NULT to, to L-tyrosine, and the majority of it is showing to be urinated out as straight N-acetyl L-tyrosine and not converting, you would think it's useless. Like it's, it's a pretty logical conclusion. And the only option is, you know, use L-tyrosine or nothing, because even if you literally shoot it straight into your fucking bloodstream, it's not going to work. But when you look at the overlapping data on NAC, N-acetyl cysteine, we start to get a more clear picture about what's going on and looking at first pass metabolism and pharmacokinetics. So in that same study, actually, showing inefficient conversion of N-acetyl L-tyrosine to tyrosine, we see a similar result reflected with N-acetyl cysteine inefficiently converting to cysteine. So this is literally the same conversion chart for an infusion of N-acetyl L-cysteine. And we can see here it goes up to, you know, 500 plus micromoles per liter. And yet cysteine levels like decrease actually, like it's even worse than, <laughs> than the NULT data. Like we have an infusion of NAC here and a cysteine reflection of decreasing levels as the NAC levels skyrocket. So now that I've learned more about pharmacokinetics, I 
personally suspect that oral ingestion of N-acetyl-L-tyrosine is required to have efficient conversion to L-tyrosine and that the IV administration itself is the reason why N-acetyl-L-tyrosine failed to increase tyrosine levels in those studies. Reason why I believe this to be the case, N-acetyl-cysteine uh, sorry, is commonly used as a supplement and a precursor to glutathione and it is widely accepted that it works extremely well. When consumed, NAC is absorbed in the gastrointestinal tract and is then converted to cysteine in the liver. The liver uses cysteine to produce glutathione, which is then used locally for glutathione synthesis or transported throughout the body to individual tissues. After a drug is swallowed, it is absorbed by the digestive system and enters the hepatic portal system, where it is then carried through the portal vein into the liver for metabolism before it reaches the rest of the body. The extent to which something is metabolized depends on numerous factors. But the main takeaway is that first pass metabolism can have a significant transformative effect on the pharmacodynamics of a parent compound. The oral ingestion of a drug, in other words, you know, it could metabolize into nothingness, which is often why some drugs aren't bioavailable orally whatsoever. But the metabolites the liver spits out may be actually what yields the main effects desired from a parent compound in some situations. Or in the case of NAC and NALT, and acetyl l tyrosine first pass metabolism may be what is necessary for adequate deacetylation into cysteine and tyrosine. So first pass metabolism may occur in the gut or in the liver. IV administration skips first pass metabolism. So if first pass metabolism after oral ingestion is what is responsible for a significant amount of the deacetylation process of N-acetylcysteine into cysteine, it's then plausible to assume that when orally ingested N-acetyl-L-tyrosine, may actually readily convert to L-tyrosine as well. And under this assumption, like I don't think it's a coincidence that people are getting effects consistently out of NALT, despite the fact that the only studies showing this inefficient conversion are via IV infusion. NAC, very, very well documented that it does what it's supposed to do and it converts effectively and is a very, very potent glutathione precursor. NALT, I suspect to be the same. And the study mentioned at the beginning of this subsection after IVing N-acetyl-L-tyrosine and N-acetylcysteine into humans, also known as NAC, the researchers concluded that, and I quote, under these conditions, the usefulness of N-acetyl-L-tyrosine and NAC as precursors for the corresponding amino acids in humans is not apparent. Orally ingested N-acetylcysteine NAC as a nutritional supplement. It has, as mentioned, hordes of liter literature supporting its, you know, a very clearly it's clearly a powerful antioxidant and does convert readily to cysteine, increases glutathione levels thereafter. So I strongly suspect that N-acetyl-L-tyrosine is potent and useful as well. And I will continue, notably my stance, I will continue to use L-tyrosine in our powder and capsule formulas because ultimately skipping the deacetylation process and providing the body with straight L-tyrosine, it's efficient. However, in RTD preparations, suspensions, liquid formats, such as energy drinks, L-tyrosine is not water soluble. You put in a couple hundred milligrams of this stuff, which is not enough to yield any significant effect. It'll all sink to the bottom. It does not suspend very well in any reasonable quantity, but N-acetyl L-tyrosine, you know, the water solubility marketing hype, it does actually suspend better in RTD formats. So this is where N-acetyl L-tyrosine has the highest potential utility, in my opinion, is in this kind of a RTD liquid suspended format where you are trying to achieve something that cannot be achieved via straight L-tyrosine and otherwise the actual effects yielded from the compound itself may not be entirely different after all. Moving on to the next active ingredient in our energy matrix, we have alpha GPC 50%, L-alpha glycerol phosphorylcholine at 400 milligrams. Alpha GPC is the highest quality and most bioavailable form of choline that crosses the blood brain barrier. Things like choline bitartrate, um, a commonly used choline supplement, have been shown to have no cognitive enhancing effect in humans at all. And alpha GPC, on the other hand, though, has been shown to cross the blood brain barrier and provide the brain with a rapidly absorbed form of choline. Choline is needed for the synthesis of cell membranes, lipid metabolism, DNA synthesis, homocysteine metabolism, and most notably to produce acetylcholine. The surge of quickly absorbed choline followed by the synthesis of acetylcholine thereafter helps support an array of functions, including but not limited to memory, focus, HGH production, 
and physical performance. And we'll get into the different attributes of Alpha GPC now with some of the different studies. So we have first off, memory, focus, and overall cognitive function. A 1993 randomized controlled study compared the efficacy of Alpha GPC and acetyl L-carnitine among 126 patients with probable cognitive decline, particularly memory loss. Alpha GPC consistently showed favorable effects in improving neuro, psychological, and behavioral test scores of the patients. Improvements also occurred in the acetyl L-carnitine recipients, but to a lesser extent. A 2003 double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial conducted on 261 patients found that alpha-GPC administration significantly improved memory and attention in older adults with cognitive impairment compared to a placebo group, and that alpha-GPC may be useful for improving cognitive function. The authors hypothesized that the clinical results gained with alpha-GPC may be ascribed to both its effects on neurotransmission and its activity in slowing the age-related loss of neuronal cells. A 2007 review of cholinergic precursors found that alpha-GPC administration appears to have a significant attenuative effect on memory and attention impairment caused by neurodegenerative disorders. It also showed that 1,200 milligrams of alpha-GPC is more efficacious than denapazil, which is, and that's at its maximum dose too, which is a pharmaceutical acetylcholinesterase inhibitor prescribed for patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. So that is a very, very notable finding. A 2008 study found that alpha GPC administration improved attention and reaction time in healthy young adults, notably compared to a placebo group. The researchers suggested that alpha GPC may be useful for improving focus and attention in healthy individuals. A 2015 randomized double blind placebo controlled crossover design study found that 200 milligrams of alpha GPC improved concentration in young adults more than 200 milligrams of caffeine. Moving on to its impact on HGH production. A 2008 randomized placebo-controlled crossover design study featuring seven men with at least two years of resistance training experience examined the effects of an alpha GPC supplement on serum GH levels. Compared to baseline, GH levels increased 44-fold after alpha GPC ingestion versus 2.6-fold after placebo ingestion. A 2012 double-blind randomized crossover study was conducted to investigate acute physiologic responses to a single one gram dose of alpha GPC. Plasma GH levels were increased by approximately 290% 60 minutes after the oral administration of alpha GPC. Now moving on to the influence of alpha GPC on force production and power output, the notable interactions between acetylcholine and motor unit recruitment in the gym in sport alpha gpc has been shown to significantly increase force production and power output and may be an effective ergogenic aid a study published in the journal of the international society of sports nutrition investigated the effects of alpha gpc supplementation on isometric strength in 19 healthy resistance trained men participants had at least one year of resistance training experience and were required to have a current one rep max of at least 1.5 times their body weight participants were randomly assigned to take either 300 milligrams of alpha GPC daily for four weeks or a placebo daily for four weeks. The study found that alpha GPC supplementation resulted in a statistically significant increase in isometric strength compared to placebo. Alpha GPC group had a 14.8% increase in isometric strength while the placebo group had a 4.6% increase in isometric strength. A 2008 randomized placebo controlled crossover design study featuring Seven men with at least two years of resistance training experience examined the effects of 600 milligrams of alpha GPC versus placebo, its effect on explosive performance and post-exercise substrate oxidation. Compared to baseline, peak bench press force increased by 14% after alpha GPC ingestion versus placebo. A 2015 randomized double-blind placebo-controlled crossover design study with 20 young participants, 10 men, 10 women, around 22 years of age, measured the acute effects of alpha GPC supplementation on peak power output via a vertical jump test in comparison to caffeine or placebo. Vertical jump peak power was 8.5% higher than placebo after taking 200 milligrams of alpha GPC, 7.5% higher than placebo after taking 400 milligrams of alpha GPC, and 2% higher than placebo after taking 200 milligrams of caffeine. The same study also measured the acute effects of alpha GPC supplementation on cognitive function in comparison to caffeine or placebo. 
One of the tests used to assess cognitive function metrics was the serial subtraction test. The SST is a clinical test used to test cognition and concentration. SST scores after taking 200 milligrams of alpha GPC were 18.1% faster than after taking 200 milligrams of caffeine and 10.5% faster than after taking placebo. Another 2015 randomized double blind placebo controlled crossover design study was conducted to determine if six days of supplementation with alpha GPC would augment isometric force production compared to a placebo. 13 college age males used either 600 milligrams of alpha GPC or placebo. And at the end of six days performed isometric mid thigh pulls and an upper body isometric test. Alpha GPC had a significant effect on increasing isometric mid thigh pull peak force. A 2017 study was designed to assess the efficacy of 250 milligrams of alpha GPC and 500 milligrams of alpha GPC in comparison to placebo and 200 milligrams of caffeine for increasing counter movement jump performance, isometric strength and psychomotor function. Group differences were noted for maximum velocity and maximum mechanical power on the counter movement jump with 250 milligrams of alpha GPC demonstrating the greatest improvement in result. A depression in circulating TSH levels was noted with the half a gram dose of alpha GPC suggesting that there may also be significant satellite dopaminergic interplay as it is known to increase central dopamine levels can reduce TSH levels. So this is thought to be another speculative kind of like off stream mechanism of alpha GPC's impact on cognitive function. Moving on to motivation levels and alpha GPC's influence on it. Alpha GPC has been shown more recently to show improvement in motivation levels as well. A 2020 study, actually 2021, conducted on 40 healthy volunteers, 31 women, nine men, aged 22 to 59, assessed their emotional state in response to alpha GPC supplementation. They took capsules containing either 200 milligrams of alpha GPC or cellulose placebo. The participants self-administered two capsules once daily at bedtime for two weeks for a total daily dose of 400 milligrams of alpha GPC in the treatment group. The coca -Row scale was used to quantify and monitor changes in human feelings and emotions. The coca -Row scale is a system applied in psychological surveys to evaluate emotional movement in the fields of academia, government, and industry. The placebo group had no effects on motivation, whereas the alpha GPC group showed an increasing trend in motivation during the intervention period. Now, moving on to the head to head of alpha GPC versus CDP choline, two of the most potent and notable cholinergics. These are often pit up against each other and we chose alpha GPC and I'm going to explain why. So in general, the main reason we would use either one or the other is to have them cross the blood brain barrier to provide the brain with choline. That is the main goal. Alpha GPC, in my opinion, accomplishes this better than CDP choline. Alpha GPC is typically 50% choline by weight, whereas CDP choline is only 18.5% choline by weight. An open clinical trial carried out to compare the efficacy and tolerability of a gram of alpha GPC versus a gram of CDP choline found that alpha GPC in most tests, possessed a statistical higher efficacy and an overall more satisfactory activity. And this is assessed by both patients and investigators when comparing to CDP choline. One reason why CDP choline, however, may be attractive is that it is a uridine prodrug and readily dissociates into both free choline and citidine following oral ingestion. In humans, citidine metabolizes into uridine, which is a very potent nootropic in its own right. Instead of including CDP choline, which would ultimately dissociate into a proportionally lower amount of choline by weight and citidine and that citidine would then need to go through a multi-step conversion process to end up at some unpredictable amount of uridine. Instead, I included a high dose of alpha GPC and uridine monophosphate separately in the formula for good measure as kind of the best of both worlds in my opinion. This way I was able to control the uridine yield manually and bypass what I deem to be a less efficient and unpredictable metabolism of citidine to citidine monophosphate to uridine monophosphate to uridine. And above and beyond all that, the literature, the uh, pharmacokinetic profile, the choline by weight, the blah, blah, blah. 
like in general anecdotes, even from other individuals in the space that have dissected the literature themselves and have their own personal anecdotes. Like it all leaned towards alpha GPC. Like this is Rhonda Patrick's personal opinion on alpha GPC versus CDP choline with her own personal experience as well. If you don't know Rhonda Patrick, she has been on Joe Rogan multiple times. She is a PhD in biomedical science and expert on nutritional health, brain health, and aging. And is one of the deferred to kind of longevity researchers in the space. Um, this is what she had to say. I have personally tried alpha GPC before at a dose of around 600 milligrams a day, an amount that is half the dose that was given to the demented patients in Mexico City. And I noticed that it did seem to improve my focus and attention. You should always leave a little room for the possibility that there may be a placebo effect. But since it's my anecdote, a smaller dose of 300 milligrams didn't really seem to have much of an effect on me. In general, I do not take alpha GPC every day. I take it on rare occasions when I'm doing a lot of writing or if there's some sort of event that I'm speaking at. There is another popular form of choline called CDP choline, which is an intermediate produced during the generation of phosphatidyl choline from choline. There are a couple of human studies looking at the effects of CDP choline in cognitive function of healthy young or middle-aged adults, usually in the range of around 1,000 milligrams a day. The only benefits were seen in young adults that had poor processing speed and verbal memory tests at baseline. Strangely, those individuals that performed well at baseline actually had impaired performance after supplementation, which may have to do with genetic variants in the receptor density or something, which just sort of goes to show you how complicated neurobiology is and how even seemingly straightforward relationships can turn out to be not so straightforward. I have personally tried CDP choline and never really noticed any enhancing effect like I seem to with alpha GPC. So that isn't to say that CDP choline is not good. It's excellent. I just prefer alpha GPC and felt the uridine on top was the best bang for the buck and the most efficacious synergy of uh, cholinergics. And that's actually not the only cholinergics. We'll get into the rest shortly and break down some of the interesting satellite benefits of uridine above and beyond its uh, you know base level cholinergic properties. But first, let's get into the next active ingredient in this formula, which is caffeine at 200 milligrams per can. Caffeine is the most well-known central nervous system stimulant on earth. It is well known for its potent effects on wakefulness, alertness, and attentional performance. When a person is awake and alert, very little adenosine is present in CNS neurons. Throughout the day though, adenosine accumulates in the neuronal synapse, binding to and activating adenosine receptors found on certain CNS neurons. And the activation of adenosine receptors ultimately increases sleepiness. When caffeine is consumed though, it binds to and antagonizes adenosine receptors, preventing adenosine from binding to and activating the receptor. The result of this, caffeine can temporarily prevent and relieve drowsiness and thus maintains or restores alertness. Of the multiple attributes, the primary driven through caffeine via adenosine receptor antagonism are the increases in feelings of wakefulness, alertness, and arousal. Caffeine can delay or prevent sleep and improve task performance during sleep deprivation. And it's been shown that shift workers who use caffeine make fewer mistakes that could be a result of drowsiness. And that brings us to its effect on improved attention and concentration. Caffeine can enhance cognitive performance on tasks that require sustained attention and concentration. This effect is thought to be related to caffeine's ability to increase the release of dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain, which are neurotransmitters that play a role in attention and focus. A literature review of all available double-blind placebo-controlled studies that assessed acute effects of caffeine on attention tasks found that caffeine clearly improved performance on simple and complex tasks. The effect caffeine has on enhancing working memory is something that has also been noted. Caffeine has been shown to improve working memory performance, which involves the ability to temporarily store information in the brain while solving a problem or performing a task. An example of a working memory task could be holding an address in your head, for example, while you're also listening to instructions about how to get there. Caffeine also affects the cholinergic system where it promotes acetylcholine release and acts as a 
moderate inhibitor of the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, thus inhibiting the breakdown of acetylcholine and influencing working memory and attention. Another notable attribute is caffeine's improvement of reaction times, allowing people to respond more quickly to stimuli. One study conducted on sleep-deprived anesthesiology resident physicians assessed the effect caffeine had on their driving performance. Residency training in anesthesiology involves care of hospitalized patients and necessitates overnight work resulting in altered sleep patterns and sleep deprivation. 26 residents participated in the study and were randomly chosen to consume either a 160 milligram caffeinated or a non-caffeinated energy drink 60 minutes before driving in a virtual reality simulator immediately after six consecutive night float shifts. After a subsequent week of night float work, residents performed the same driving session in a crossover fashion with the opposite intervention. Psychomotor vigilance task testing was used to evaluate reaction time and lapses in attention. After consuming a caffeinated energy drink on conclusion of six shifts of night float work, anesthesiology residents had improved control of driving performance variables in a high fidelity driving simulator, including a significant reduction in collisions as well as slightly faster reaction times. Caffeine can also reduce feelings of mental fatigue, making it easier to stay focused and engaged in cognitive tasks. Moving on to dosage and the notable discrepancies in uh, dose response as well as uh, what makes sense for you. So the minimum effective dose of caffeine varies depending on several factors, including an individual's body weight, tolerance to caffeine, and sensitivity to its effects. Research suggests that the minimum effective dose of caffeine is likely around 40 to 50 milligrams, which is roughly equivalent to a small cup of coffee. However, other studies assessing just how low of a dose can yield a positive effect have found that surprisingly low dosages can still move the needle. A double blind study measured the effects of zero milligrams, 12.5 milligrams, 25, 50, and 100 milligrams of caffeine on cognitive performance, mood, and thirst in adults with low and moderate to high habitual caffeine intakes. Interestingly enough, 12 and a half milligrams of caffeine improved cognitive performance during both simple and stressful demanding tasks. This amount of caffeine is equivalent to about a quarter of a serving of tea and less than a quarter of a serving of coffee. On a body weight basis, 12.5 milligrams equated to 0.18 milligram per kilogram. At the time, that was reported to be the lowest dose of caffeine to reliably affect cognitive performance in human adults. Now the dose for mental or physical performance may be slightly different than the minimum effective dose for just any effect at all. Following low to moderate, low classified as roughly 40 milligrams or 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, to moderate intake, which is typically around 300 milligrams or four milligram per kilogram, caffeine doses, alertness, vigilance, attention, reaction time, and attention improve. However, less consistent effects are observed on memory and higher order executive functions such as judgment and decision making. In terms of physical performance, the minimum effective dose of caffeine for improving metrics such as time to exhaustion, muscle strength, endurance, and high intensity sprints has been shown to be around three to six milligram per kilogram of body weight or roughly 200 to 400 milligrams for a 150 pound person. All that said, it is absolutely worth noting that some people may experience both cognitive and physical performance benefits at lower doses than the doses mentioned for physical performance enhancement and others may require higher doses to see an effect themselves. Generally speaking, healthy adults can safely consume up to 400 milligrams of caffeine per day. Moving on to the next active ingredient in the energy matrix, we have uridine monophosphate at 200 milligrams. So I mentioned uridine briefly already. Expanding on that, uridine monophosphate is a nucleotide that is involved in the synthesis of cellular membranes and the production of neurotransmitters. Data suggests that uridine monophosphate may improve cognitive performance via increased synthesis of brain-specific phospholipids and the enhancement of synaptic plasticity. This compound has shown to interact in unique and synergistic ways with both the cholinergic and dopaminergic pathways. These effects are most notable when uridine is stacked alongside central nervous system stimulants, 
dopaminergic drugs or other cholinergic compounds. Users often report being more productive, task oriented and focused when taking uridine monophosphate and reduced procrastination and brain fog are also common anecdotes after its use. Before getting into the attributes and literature on uridine, I just want to touch on the difference between uridine versus uridine monophosphate and the different names, uridine 5-monophosphate, UMP. Uridine is naturally present in some foods in the form of ribonucleic acid, RNA. This includes, but is not limited to, organ meats like liver and pancreas, brewer's yeast, tomatoes, goats and sheep's milk, sugarcane extract, beer, and broccoli. There is conflicting evidence as to how bioavailable uridine is in the form of RNA in food. However, uridine monophosphate has been shown to be both bioavailable and able to enter circulation from the digestive tract, hence the inclusion of uridine monophosphate. Now getting into uridine's attributes and literature, starting off with a overview of its effect on modulation of central nervous system stimulant effects and unique dopaminergic activity. First off, uridine's effects in conjunction with amphetamines and cocaine, coming in hot. <laughs> in a study assessing uridine and stimulant-induced motor activity, uridine-treated rats exhibited a significant increase in sensitivity to amphetamine and cocaine during rotation tests. The neurotoxin 6-OHDA, 6-hydroxydopamine, is commonly used in animal models to selectively destroy dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, a region of the midbrain that plays a key role in motor control to mimic the loss of dopamine neurons seen in individuals with Parkinson's disease. Unilateral lesioned 6-OHDA, 6-hydroxydopamine mice rotate because of the loss of dopamine producing neurons in one hemisphere of the brain, which leads to an imbalance in dopamine levels between the two hemispheres. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that helps to regulate movement and the loss of dopamine producing neurons in one hemisphere of the brain leads to a reduction in dopamine levels on that side of the brain. The dopamine depletion can cause this asymmetry in activity of the basal ganglia, a group of brain structures involved in motor control, and this resulting imbalance of activity between the two hemispheres leads to a rotational behavior in the mouse where it continuously turns in one direction. You can see here a visual exemplification of this. This is a rat 6-hydroxydopamine hydro lesion model. This rotational behavior is a classic hallmark of the 6-OHDA unilateral lesion model of Parkinson's disease and is commonly used as a measure of motor deficits in preclinical studies. The greater the bias towards rotating in one direction, the more Parkinsonian the animal. Amphetamine works by increasing the release of dopamine from the presynaptic neuron and blocking the reuptake of dopamine thereby increasing dopamine levels in the synaptic cleft. This results in a surge of dopamine release, leading to feelings of euphoria, increased energy, and alertness. Cocaine, on the other hand, works a bit differently. This is working primarily by blocking the reuptake of dopamine, leading to an accumulation of dopamine in the synaptic cleft. This also results in increased dopamine levels in the brain, leading to feelings of pleasure, increased energy, and heightened arousal. Both drugs can have similar effects on dopamine, but amphetamine tends to produce a more prolonged and sustained increase in dopamine release, while cocaine has a shorter and more intense effect on dopamine levels. Additionally, amphetamine can also affect the release and reuptake of other neurotransmitters as well, such as norepinephrine and serotonin, which can contribute to its overall effects on mood and behavior. When amphetamine or cocaine is administered to unilaterally lesion 6-hydroxydopamine mice, these drugs can enhance the release and or block the reuptake of dopamine in the remaining hemisphere of the brain, leading to an even greater imbalance in dopamine levels between the two hemispheres. So as you can see here in this drug-induced rotational test, this further exacerbates the rotational behavior in the mice, leading to increased turning in the same direction. Paradoxically, despite exhibiting a clear potentiation of dopaminergic behavior, uridine has shown to slightly reduce amphetamine-induced dopamine release in some instances as well. 
The results of the study show that uridine does not affect dopamine mediated behaviors when administered by itself, but appears to alter dopamine transmission when combined with various dopaminergic agents. Its effects on enhancing dopamine related behaviors with a concurrent inhibition of the amphetamine induced dopamine released necessary to achieve that level of stimulation implies that it has a positive influence overall on dopamine receptor sensitivity, which then leads us into the next subsection where we discuss uridine's restorative potential of destroyed dopaminergic neurons. Other studies have shown different, equally interesting findings. Another rodent model assessed the impact uridine and docosahexaenoic acid, also known as DHA. That's a really hard one to say, docosahexaenoic acid, damn. Mouthful and a half. EPA and DHA, like the DHA from fish oil, have the effects of uridine and DHA on dextroamphetamine treated rats with partial unilateral 6 hydroxy dopamine induced striatal lesions. In this study, both uridine monophosphate and DHA reduced dextroamphetamine induced rotations. And again, dextroamphetamine like dexedrine, but significantly elevated striatal dopamine levels. Tyrosine hydroxylase activity, again, remember the rate limiting step in the synthesis of dopamine from, from tyrosine upstream, tyrosine hydroxylase protein, and synapsin 1 on the lesion side. Normally, in these lesion rats, this reduction in rotations would imply an inhibitory effect on dopaminergic neurotransmission. However, in this case, we can see that uridine has partially restored destroyed dopaminergic neurons to such an extent that the restored dopaminergic neurotransmission potential on the lesion side is now seemingly evening out the stimulant induced rotations that otherwise would have been disproportionately higher in a more Parkinsonian rat. So the authors of the study concluded that giving uridine and DHA may partially restore dopaminergic neurotransmission in this model of Parkinson's disease. This is not just promising for the potential efficacy of uridine and its complementary effects with other nootropics, but also for the potential dopamine receptor density slash sensitivity upregulation it could have in those who have a high stimulant tolerance, have abused stimulants in the past, or those seeking general cognitive support slash neuroprotection. Now moving on to the cholinergic effects. Uridine monophosphate is also a cholinergic agent and has potential synergy alongside choline containing phospholipids like alpha GPC, for example, and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like huperidine A. The pathway in which uridine increases brain concentrations of phosphatidylcholine is called the Kennedy pathway. The Kennedy pathway is a series of enzyme catalyzed reactions that convert CDP choline, cytidine, and uridine into phospholipids such as phosphatidylcholine and this one's a hard one, phosphatidylethylenolamine. <laughs> that one is a mouthful. Through this pathway, uridine can influence many cognitive functions, including memory, learning, and attention. Although CDP choline is a cofactor in phosphatidylcholine synthesis via the Kennedy pathway, orally ingested CDP choline is dissociated completely and is a prodrug for choline and cytidine, as mentioned earlier in the video. So oral ingestion of CDP choline does not raise plasma CDP choline levels at all. So instead, as you would expect, through this dissociation, it raises plasma cytidine and choline levels only. Moving on to uridine's effects on mood modulation, uridine has been shown to have anxiolytic effects, meaning it may reduce anxiety levels. It has also been shown to act as a potent mood stabilizer in depressed adolescents with bipolar disorder. Moving on to the next active ingredient in the Gorilla Mind Energy Matrix, we have L-theanine at 100 milligrams, L-theanine, L-theanine, one of those two. It was discovered as a constituent of green tea in 1949, and in 1950, it was isolated from Gyokuro leaves. I might be butchering the pronunciation of that. Gyokuro. Yeah, the main benefits of L-theanine are associated with promoting a relaxed state without causing drowsiness or sedation. After consumption, L-theanine crosses the blood-brain barrier, 
and promotes an increase in alpha waves. This increase in alpha waves may be responsible for L-theanine's effects on stress and anxiety reduction. Theanine or theanine is structurally similar to the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate and binds to glutamate receptors that acts as an antagonist at the AMPA and kinate receptors and acts as a partial coagonist of the NMDA receptors. Partial NMDA agonists bind to and activate the NMDA receptor, but also only have partial efficacy at the receptor relative to a full agonist. Theanine also blocks the reuptake of glutamate and glutamine via the inhibition of glutamine transporters and glutamate transporters. Theanine increases dopamine, glycine, BDNF, and NGF levels in various areas of the brain. It may also increase serotonin levels, but that is less certain. There is conflicting literature on that component specifically. Its effects on anxiety and calmness. A study conducted on 20 healthy males aged 18 to 30 years old found that L-theanine supplementation promoted the release of alpha waves and this led to enhanced mental relaxation and concentration. Another study conducted on 20 fifth year university students during pharmacy practice found that L-theanine supplementation had a notable effect on attenuating stress. L-theanine also influences a attention and reaction time. In a study conducted on 18 healthy university student volunteers, L-theanine had a pronounced effect on attention performance and reaction time response in subjects prone to having high anxiety. It also seems to improve memory and attention. In a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study conducted on 91 people with minor brain damage, L-theanine improved memory, selective attention, and alertness during a memory test. L-theanine also appears to improve verbal fluency and executive function. In another randomized controlled trial, 30 healthy adults were given 200 milligrams of L-theanine per day or placebo. Verbal fluency and executive function scores improved after L-theanine administration. Stress levels also decreased and sleep quality improved after L-theanine administration. L-theanine stacks. This is one of the most commonly stacked nootropic ingredients and L-theanine appears to have some synergy with certain CNS stimulants. For example, the caffeine plus L-theanine stack is one of the most basic and effective nootropic stacks to date. And how you would stack them, how you stack L-theanine with caffeine for enhanced cognitive function, L-theanine may have cognitive enhancing effects, especially when taken with caffeine. A randomized controlled trial compared the effects of 50 milligrams caffeine with and without 100 milligrams of L-theanine on cognition and mood in 27 healthy volunteers. The L-theanine and caffeine combination improved both speed and accuracy of performance of the attention switching task at 60 minutes and reduced susceptibility to distracting information in the memory task at both 60 minutes and 90 minutes. Another randomized controlled trial investigated the effect of a combination of 97 milligrams L-theanine and 40 milligrams caffeine as compared to placebo treatment on cognitive performance, alertness, blood pressure, and heart rate in a sample of 44 young adults. The combination of moderate levels of L-theanine and caffeine significantly improved accuracy during task switching and self-reported alertness and reduced self-reported tiredness. A 2019 double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial found that stacking L-theanine, caffeine, and tyrosine may improve mental and physical performance in athletes and could hold ergogenic value for athletes in sport requiring rapid and accurate movement. Stacking to smooth out the caffeine jitters. This is something that L-theanine is notorious for and being very, very complementary to actually support this function. L-theanine has been shown to suppress the blood pressure increasing effects of caffeine and may also counteract blood pressure increases under stressful conditions. Although the mechanisms behind the synergistic effect of L-theanine and caffeine on cognition are not completely understood, L-theanine's relaxation promoting properties are likely responsible for the reduced anxiousness and jitters associated with caffeine use. And this bleeds into its impact on sleep quality in conjunction with caffeine, because keep in mind the half-life of caffeine and how long it takes to get out of your system. A lot of people who are using caffeine end up having it in their system residually at some potentially problematic amount from a adenosine receptor antagonism context still at trying to go to sleep. 
and stacking L-theanine with caffeine seems to have a attenuative effect and enhanced sleep quality after caffeine use. One notable rodent model found that L-theanine could partially counteract caffeine-induced sleep disturbances. L-theanine has very potent effects on sleep as well. A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial conducted on boys previously diagnosed with ADHD found that L-theanine use resulted in significantly higher sleep percentage and sleep efficiency scores, along with a non-significant trend for less activity during sleep compared to those in the placebo group. A 2019 double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial assessed the effects of L-theanine on 46 participants with a DSM-5 diagnosis of Generalized Anxiety Disorder, GAD. For context, a DSM-5 diagnosis of GAD has a prerequisite of several very troubling traits. Just one of the many criteria is excessive anxiety and worry, apprehensive expectation occurring more days than not for at least six months about a number of events or activities such as work or school performance. The 2019 trial found that l may improve sleep satisfaction as well as symptoms of sleep disturbance. The next active ingredient in the Gorilla Mind Energy Matrix is saffron extract. This is a unique ingredient that Leo actually told me about years ago. Rest in peace, Leo and longevity. Very, very unique, interesting, high utility compound that is very slept on in my opinion and potentially has a lot of benefit for a myriad of individuals that don't even know it exists. This is something that you typically see maybe in like niche health supplement, you know, companies essentially. More recently, I've started to feature it in, you know, nootropic formulas and whatnot for its unique anti-anhedonic and dopaminergic effects and serotonergic effects and then more recently, I believe this is probably the first that's ever been done, putting it in an energy drink. I don't think I've ever seen somebody put in uridine, saffron, or the dosages of some of the other cholinergics and whatnot and dopaminergics in this product. Like this is a full spectrum banger of a cognitive enhancing formula. I, I keep highlighting it because it's just pretty, it's fucking cool to me. So I think a lot of people are going to be uh, pretty optimistic, enthusiastic, and just really like what it does when they actually dig into some of the saffron data and some of this other stuff that I'm going over. This is something that has a lot of potential. And again, stoked to bring it in a more mainstream format that may get into the hands of more people because this is ultimately a hopefully mainstream appealing product. So anyways, getting into saffron extract, it is derived from the dried stigmas of the Crocus sativus plant, and it has been traditionally used for its medicinal properties. It has gained scientific attention recently for its potential antidepressant effects. Several studies have shown that saffron extract has antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and antidepressant effects, and it may also have anti-cancer and neuroprotective properties. I say that with a hard caveat and disclaimer, this is not my stance, this is just what the literature has suggested. Saffron extract has shown to increase the levels of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine in the brain as well, and also preserve dopaminergic neurons. You can start to see, as I mentioned, some of this, uh, some of these neurotransmitter cascades, some of the effects on receptor, sen receptor sensitivity and upregulation and expression where the synergy of the formula really comes together and why some of these compounds were selected specifically in unison with one another. Getting into saffron's antidepressant, anxiety, and anti-anhedonic effects. Saffron extract has a clear track record of notable antidepressant effects, consistently outperforming placebo and performing comparably with the effects of pharmaceutical SSRIs. In a double-blind controlled clinical trial, 66 patients with major depressive disorder accompanied by anxious distress were randomly assigned to receive either saffron or citalopram, a pharmaceutical SSRI for six weeks. The study found that both saffron and citalopram showed significant improvement in depression and anxiety scores with no significant difference between the two. Very, very notable and impressive. In a 2014 randomized double-blind parallel group study, 40 patients with a diagnosis of mild to moderate depression were randomly chosen to receive either fluoxetine at 40 milligrams per day, another pharmaceutical SSRI, 
or saffron extract, 30 milligrams per day for six weeks. Saffron extract showed the same antidepressant efficacy compared with fluoxetine in patients who were suffering from depression another very notable and impressive outcome. These results can be seen consistently across the board when comparing saffron extract with pharmaceutical SSRIs. Here we have a table showing a bunch of different studies of saffron stacked up against pharmaceutical SSRIs and having comparable outcomes from a depression metrics improvement standpoint, but seemingly with a superior mechanism of action. Saffron extract has also been shown to ameliorate anhedonia, which suggests a more potent action in the regulation of dopamine than serotonin or other monoamines. Anhedonia refers to the reduced ability to experience pleasure and is associated with low levels of dopamine. Anxiety and depression appear to be associated with the decreased activity of both serotonin and dopamine. It is worth highlighting that the anti-anhedonic effects of antidepressants differ depending on the compound's mechanism of action for example, saffron extract, despite consistently achieving similar metrics to SSRIs, achieves cognitive changes via different and potentially superior, depending on an individual's brain chemistry, mechanisms of action. Randomized controlled trials have actually been conducted using saffron extract as a treatment for SSRI-induced sexual dysfunction. So despite the fact that they are stacked, saffron being stacked up against, you know, citalopram or fluoxetine, having comparable, you know, depression score metrics and improvements, it is also something that is used to treat, in some instances, side effects of SSRIs like sexual dysfunction and has anti-anhedonic properties and dopaminergic act activity that is just not seen with these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. This strongly suggests that the way saffron extract produces antidepressant effects as potent as pharmaceutical reuptake inhibitors extends past its serotonergic effects. Moving on to the dopaminergic activity and expanding on it, saffron extract appears to interact with both MAOA and MAOB in the brain. A systematic review found that the administration of saffron extract and its constituents increases glutamate and dopamine levels in the brain in a dose-dependent manner. A recent 2021 randomized controlled trial conducted on young men found that the addition of a saffron supplement to resistance training resulted in greater improvements in happiness levels than resistance training alone. AEA, an endogenous ligand for the CB1 cannabinoid receptor, 2AG, the primary endogenous ligand for the CB2 cannabinoid receptor, dopamine and beta endorphin concentrations significantly increased in the resistance training plus saffron group while no changes were detected in the resistance training only group. Serotonin concentrations and happiness levels significantly increased in both groups with greater changes in the resistance training plus saffron group. In addition, both groups experienced significantly increased muscular endurance with greater changes in the resistance training plus saffron group. A 2018 randomized controlled trial was conducted to determine the effectiveness of saffron on reducing depression among 57 recovered consumers of methamphetamine living with HIV slash AIDS. Saffron was determined to be an effective supplement through its ability to improve depression in these individuals, likely by increasing dopamine and serotonin secretion in the brain. These results are just scratching the surface of the positive literature available on saffron's cognitive effects, and I am stoked to Put it in a formula like this. I think it will uh, move the needle and uh, be impactful. And a lot of people will very, very much appreciate this, uh, I don't know, exotic entry that they otherwise may have not known had such unique applications and potency. Moving on to the final ingredient in the Gorilla Mine Energy Matrix, we have Huperzine at 200 micrograms. This is a natural compound found in the plant Huperzia serrata, which has been used in traditional Chinese medicine for centuries. Its cholinergic activity is its main mechanism of action, but it does also have dopaminergic activity, and we will get into both right now. Starting with cholinergic activity, Huperzine A is a potent and selective inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase, an enzyme that breaks down the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the brain. 
by inhibiting acetylcholine, huperazine A increases the levels of acetylcholine in the brain leading to enhanced cholinergic neurotransmission. This increased cholinergic activity has been shown to improve cognitive function, memory, and learning. In addition to its acetylcholinesterase inhibiting activity, huperazine A also has neuroprotective effects. It has been shown to protect neurons from oxidative stress and to promote the growth and survival of neurons. Acetylcholine is not only a major regulator of cognitive performance, but it is also an important neurotransmitter needed for optimal muscular contractions during exercise. A meta-analysis of placebo-controlled randomized trials assessed the effects of huperazine A on patients with Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Eight trials with 733 patients showed that huperazine A significantly improved cognitive function measured by memory quotient in patients with Alzheimer's disease. A four-week clinical trial was conducted to determine the efficacy of 100 micrograms of huperazine A dosed twice per day on memory and learning performance in 34 pairs of junior middle school students complaining of memory inadequacy. At the end of the trial, the huperazine A group's memory quotient was more than that of the placebo group and Chinese language lesson scores in the Huperzine A group were elevated as well, suggesting enhanced memory and learning performance in Huperzine A treated adolescent students. And this is in, again, young, you know, healthy individuals, not those experiencing significant severe cognitive decline. Moving on to dopaminergic activity, despite primarily acting as a cholinergic, some evidence suggests that Huperzine A may also influence the levels of other neurotransmitters, including dopamine. A rodent model found that huperzine A significantly increased the levels of dopamine and norepinephrine throughout the prefrontal cortex. Another rodent model found that huperzine A had similar potency on increasing dopamine levels to the pharmaceutical acetylcholinesterase inhibitor Dinapazil, which again, similar to saffron versus SSRIs, like huperazine A versus, you know, denapazil and having comparable efficacy metrics. Very, very impressive in my opinion. Now moving on to the huperazine A and cocaine clinical trial. Yes, you heard me correctly. Changes in the dopamine system due to drugs of abuse have been extensively studied. However, cholinergic transmission is also altered by drugs of abuse and contributes to psychostimulant reinforcement. For example, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors block cocaine self-administration in monkeys. This finding, among others in animal models, have led researchers to investigate the safety and preliminary efficacy of acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like huperazine A as a treatment for cocaine use disorder. In a 2015 double-blind randomized placebo-controlled study, participants were randomly chosen to receive huperazine A or placebo. Participants received randomized infusions of cocaine, 0 and 40 milligrams via IV, on days one and nine. On day 10, participants received non-contingent randomized infusions of cocaine, zero and 20 milligrams IV, before being given five opportunities at 15 minute intervals to purchase additional infusions or to keep $5 for each choice opportunity. Time course and peak effects analyses showed that treatment with 400 micrograms of huperazine A significantly attenuated cocaine-induced increases of bad effects and willing to pay, i.e. how much are you willing to pay for the cocaine infusion you just received in dollars and huperazine A having a significantly attenuative effect on this entire model. And that is it. That is the breakdown of the new Gorilla Mind energy drinks. I am stoked for you guys to try them. Available on the website now, GorillaMind.com, GorillaMindEnergy.com, and soon to be Amazon, fulfilled through Amazon Prime, uh, retail outlets, hopefully, global distribution. You know, all these things are on my radar and are hopefully on the horizon in the near future. I'm stoked for you guys to try it. As mentioned, the flavors will stand with titans, if not edge them out. Like I am very confident this is the best tasting product we've ever put out. It will be favored over some of your current favorites, as bold as that is to say. Some of your favorites that you do drink on a regular basis, you will actually drink these and be like, holy shit, I didn't even think it was possible to do better, but you've one up them. That is how good this stuff is. And on top of that, like these could stand on their own with rinky dink caffeine taurine formulas. Like if you actually want, like we could have actually just put out, you know, the standard caffeine taurine, couple B vitamins, 
and just had a bit better taste. And I think these would have sold like with the brand name, they look fucking badass. I think the flavors are amazing. But on top of that, having the full blown nootropic infused, uh, energy matrix that I developed for this formula and getting it suspended without affecting the flavor system and everything like this is, I am absurdly optimistic about this. And I think you guys will love it. It has a very distinct effect that is unique to anything out there and has uh, cognitive properties that could be uh, very positive outside of the basic stimulate you out of your tree kind of thing most people seek out of energy drinks. Like this could have, like you heard me break down the saffron data, some of the um, you know, dopaminergic neurotransmission data. It's very, very promising and stoked for you guys to try it. Fucking thrilled about this product. And I think you guys will love it too. Check it out. Link in description below. Thank you guys for all the support continuing with me throughout this ride. And I will talk to you guys soon.